Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. Now I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week we're talking about season four, episode 22, the final episode of season four. Believe it or not, guys, we are going to just waltz our way right into the last season of Miami Vice. That our two year journey has brought us to this point, to this point, <laughs> to the sunny amnesia point. Since day one, we were waiting to get to here. We are finally here. This episode is titled Mirror Image, and it originally premiered on May 6, 1988. It is written by Daniel Sackheim and Nelson Oramas. Now, Nelson Oramas, I want to talk about. Daniel Sackheim doesn't write any more episodes. Nelson Oramas was in the episode Smuggler's Blues as the bomb specialist who disarmed the bomb when it was attached to Trudy. He was also the bomb specialist in the episode Sons and Lovers with the bit when baby tubs disappeared and that the car exploded well he's not very good at his job <laughs> <laughs> he also appeared in another episode he didn't write down because he wasn't a bomb specialist in that episode that, that one doesn't matter <laughs> do you think they just kept hiring him as an uh extra like he, he kept trying to like pitch him his episode like i wrote one guys like come on you know they're like oh, okay okay <laughs> I wrote one, guys. Let's I wrote see what one. You got. I'm gonna blow up Sunny. Like, all right, Nelson. I think you got an explosion <laughs> problem. Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the director is Richard Compton, who also directed, as you all know, Down for the Count, Part One and Two. Everyone's in sh- or everybody's in showbiz in the Big Thaw. But he's got two more episodes. <laughs> we gotta talk about that Big Thaw one. <laughs> Still floating around out there, Melissa. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Never been found. Before we get started, I can check in and see what's going on in each other's lives. Guys, I got a programming note for all you pals out there. So this is, as we mentioned, the final episode of season four. So we're wrapping up a season. We're going to do what we normally do, which is we do one episode where we take a look back at season four and talk about all the highlights and guest stars and music and our favorite episodes and our favorite guest stars and everyone else that was on and then we take a look forward to season five we're going to take our uh, guests at what we think is going to happen in the season and melissa laughs at us over her brandy <laughs> she swirls it you have no idea yes <laughs> so that'll happen next week and then the week after that will be our season four clip show which is always a ton of fun picking out our favorite moments from the season so we'll have that and then we're going to take a little break pals We're going to take a nice three-week vacation, but we're not going to leave you high and dry. We are. What we're going to do is we're going to put in our top three episodes of season four. Now, this isn't the top three Vice episodes. I think based on the selection that was in this season, it's pretty clear what the top three episodes are. House of October. (laughs) (laughs) We're looking at you. (laughs) What we're going to do is we're going to add the top three Go With The Heat episodes from season four. It's going to give us a time to get our bodies and brains ready for season five and the continuation of Sunny Amnesia. Give us a chance to take a little breather and then also to re-air these, our three favorites. So we want to hear from you. Email us, gowiththeheat at gmail.com. Put in the subject line season four favorite and vote on your favorite tell us what your number one favorite episode of go with the heat was in season four then we're going to tally up all the votes and then we'll put out our top three reruns we're going to do like a summer a summer rerun yep <laughs> three weeks the summer reruns by style <laughs> <laughs> so we'd love to hear from you email us go with the heat at gmail.com let us know what your favorite go with the heat episodes are from season four and then we'll be back School will be back in session, and we'll be ready for Season 5 of Miami Vice and our sprint to the end of the show. Well, speaking of coming to an end, both Season 4 and Sonny Crockett, who, that when that bullet should have killed him, we wouldn't have got here. But instead, we're going to blow him up. <laughs> and then it'll turn into Sonny Burnett, and then we're going to deal with them later. So let's c- talk about the continuation of the death of Sonny Crockett. So we open up, Sonny is sitting. He's watching a man get out of a limo sitting on like the docks. He's watching. It's going to be this big mob boss meetup that's going to happen out on this boat. He's working undercover. It's Gutierrez and Manolo. It's their two who are going to meet out on this boat. Rico comes walking up and he's asking, like, hey, Sonny, you doing all right, man? And Sonny clearly is not doing okay. And he lets yeah, Tubbs. He's not wearing a coat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Tubbs and, is I mean, worried about him. In, in this Miami weather, no coat. <laughs> worried about his buddy being cold out there on the water 
Sunny's saying he doesn't like people smothering him, but Tubbs is like, you're clearly not right, bro. And I want to make sure that you're good before you go out on this mission that's going to be out on a boat all by yourself. Yeah, I mean. You're not going to have any backup out there or anything, so making sure you're good. <laughs> this is like the quickest partner fight ever, you know? It's like, leave me alone. Stop telling me to relax. I'm sorry, bro. I'm just a little bitchy right now. <laughs> Tubbs is suggesting, like, you've come back too early. Maybe you should have taken it slower to come back. Yeah, he's like, I don't call this R&R. &R. &R. This is not my idea of R&R. &R. It's being out in a boat with two gangsters, basically. Yeah. Two of the biggest but mobsters this, around. But this is Sonny Crockett. You know him. You know, bury those feelings and get back to work. So we fast forward to when Sonny's out on the boat and he's hauling in the best Marlin ever. Not a stock footage Marlin, <laughs> I'll have you know. <laughs> that was a real Marlin they were trying to get. <laughs> Didn't look like something out of. First of all, it was not on a hook. Let's address that part. <laughs> yeah, it's it like it's like around. from a '60s nature documentary <laughs> or something. <laughs> It was reminiscent Cut of right the medical. National Geographic. Exactly, it was reminiscent of the medical uh, <laughs> footage in, in Sonny's <laughs> surgery episode. <laughs> He's talking to Gutierrez, who's like the partner with Manolo. But well, like no, they're not partners. Actually, I think they're rivals. And this is a, the big deal: is that they keep talking about that Crockett has got them together, and it's a huge deal that he could if he could barter some kind of agreement between the two of them. It's epic that he has done this. Uh, it was weird, the dynamic between Manolo and Gutierrez, because Gutierrez is like hanging out at Manolo's house, like at the pool the whole yeah, time. I thought that was weird, too. But I think it was because Manolo like trusted him after he thought he got blown up, too. You know, I know we're skipping ahead I, here, but I, I think I that was he part of it, too. Solo. I don't think he worked for him until then. I think that's a new thing. They were talking about, he mm -hmm. said, you got you. How did you get these two together? How did you get them to meet with me? And then he didn't even Manolo didn't even show up. <laughs> <laughs> Sonny is hinting to Gutierrez that he knows what Manolo's up to and he's got some news that he wants to give to Gutierrez but he's hauling in that Marlin so he's too busy to take a break or sailfish or whatever it is that he's trying to bring in and so Gutierrez is like you know bro alright I understand who's more important here he goes down below deck and he opens up a little door and in there is a bomb he starts the bomb and he gives himself plenty of time <laughs> A whole 55 seconds to be still, able to get out. He sets it and it's like 55, but he looks at his watch and he thinks about it. It's like, you only have a minute, dude. Get the hell out of the boat. <laughs> he even goes up deck, stops, bullshits with Sonny for a few minutes, and then climbs up and like jumps off into a speedboat passing not, by. Not <laughs> very know, just... well, mind you. <laughs> yeah. Mind you, Sonny's so locked into trying to catch this Marlin that when Gutierrez is leaving, he's like, hey, man, you know, like, come on. You know, you, you, you're going to want to get off the boat. So he's like, nah, you go. Uh, I, I'm, uh, you know, <laughs> this is going on my mantle. <laughs> Gutierrez jumps off, face plants onto a speedboat that's going by. He leaves. You see Sonny get up and start to run. And then Nelson or almost his bomb explodes <laughs> <laughs> and destroys the yacht. And then we go to the opening credits. So is Sonny dead? Is he? Question mark. There's still a whole season to go. <laughs> <laughs> still a whole episode to go. <laughs> Before you move on for the rest of the episode, let's check in with this week's guest stars because there is one that is unmistakable. Yeah, so let's start off. I mean, it's a pretty guest star packed episode closing out the season. We have Chris Cooper, who plays Detective Jimmy Hagovich. You might remember him from movies like American Beauty, October Sky, he plays the dad, The Born Identity. Capote, Siriana, The Amazing Spider-Man 2, or the 2011 The Muppets. I mean, everyone's seen The Muppets. <laughs> <laughs> Broke out in the late 80s. He went to the University of Missouri, Columbia, and was in their theater program. Originally, his major was set design. He liked to build the sets, but he suffered from a particularly bad case of shyness. He actually took acting classes to try and get over his shyness. Prior to breaking out on screen, Cooper worked at renovating apartments, he worked as a janitor, and as a chauffeur, and also spent two years acting on the stage before his film debut in the 1987 movie Mate Juan. Just a crap ton of really good movies. Got quite the resume. Funny story for him is he met his wife in 1979 when uh, she actually she carried some sheetrock up eight flights of stairs. <laughs> 
Well, she's a keeper. <laughs> <laughs> they actually they they have a charity organization in the name of their now deceased son Jesse Cooper. Their son was born with cerebral palsy and uh, died in 2005, tragically. Our next guest star is Antonio Fargus, who plays Alexandro Gutierrez. Huggy Bear. Yep. Yeah, that's right. Best known for his 1970s exploitation movies and as being the character Huggy Bear in the 70s cop show Starsky and Hutch. Some of his breakout role was in the late 60s comedy, Putney Swope, which has basically kind of gotten a cult following today. He also played Link Brown in Foxy Brown, also mm. popped up in Shaft. So, you know, when I say famous for black exploitation movies, I mean like in the biggest ones of the era. Yeah. So he was doing TV stuff in the mid 80s. He played the father of Angie Hubbard in the uh, soap opera, All My Children. He also doesn't mind making fun of his black exploitation roots as he popped up with a cameo in I'm Gonna Get You Sucker. Oh, and then later worked, yeah. worked again with the Wayans in Don't Be a Menace. He's popped up on TV in a number of guest spots. Shows like Living Single, Martin, French Pr Prince of Bel-Air, and the Steve Harvey Show. He had a regular as Doc on Everybody Hates Chris. And side note, his son Justin, Justin Fargus, Played running back for the Denver Broncos and the Oakland Raiders. Yeah, he so. was the Raider fans thought he was like the next coming. And he wasn't. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Turns out it wasn't true. <laughs> his daughter-in-law. Also, his daughter-in-law is the LSU basketball coach, Nikki Caldwell. Damn. Our next guest star is Brent Jennings. He plays Sergeant Rolando Jordan. Brent Jennings also appeared in a few episodes of Vice Already. He played Robbery Sergeant Parati in the episode Home Invaders. And he played, I'm quoting here, Jive Man in the episode <laughs> Heart of Darkness. Glad you were quoting that, not making it up on your own. <laughs> <laughs> Big step up going from Jive Man to, you know, <laughs> playing actual cops with speaking parts. <laughs> Brent Jennings also appeared in films Witness, Red Heat, Another 48 Hours, Life, and Moneyball. So finally, probably our least famous guest star <laughs> in the entire episode, this little actress named Julia Fiona Roberts. Never heard of her. I don't know. If I don't you've know. Ever if heard do of anything her. big? Yeah. Yeah. She played. She played Polly Wheeler, and I think she played a prostitute in something. <laughs> I, I joke, I kid, I kid. She's actually one of the most successful actresses um, and was one of the highest paid actresses throughout. In fact, I believe there was a good portion of the 90s into the early 2000s. She was the highest paid actress in the world. She popped up in some pretty big movies all the way from her starts in movies like Mystic Pizza, Pretty Woman, newer titles like Aaron Brockovich, Notting Hill. She was in the Ocean's Eleven franchise, Charlie Wilson's War, Eat, Pray, Love, Pelican Brief. Uh, I can just go on and on and on. And to give you an idea how far she's come, when she was cast in Pretty Woman in 1990, she, she received $300,000. In 2003, when she uh, signed on to do Mona Lisa Smile, it was for $25 million. Damn, that's a little bit of a pay race. She got some work done in between. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't even know what that other movie is. That Mona Lisa spot. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> He's been named People's Most Beautiful Woman a record five times. And as of 2007, it's worth over $140 million. Yeah, she's done well for herself. Yeah. That's all right. So she grew up in Decanter, Georgia. Her parents ran a children's acting school. Um, Small world. <laughs> so uh actually a pretty interesting story that so one of their clients happened to be martin luther king jr and coretta scott king damn their kids attended the school in fact her dad walter was yolanda denise king's act acting coach and as a thank you for his service miss king actually paid mr roberts hospital bill when julia was born wow that is 
Insane. Yeah. First movie would be the movie Satisfaction in 1988 with Liam Nelson. 87 is when she would make her first TV appearance as a juvenile rape victim in season one of Crime Story. Oh, weird small world. (laughs) She would go from that to doing this episode of Vice and her first feature film uh, starring role in Mystic Pizza. And then she would just start knocking them out of the park. She she went from Mystic Pizza to Pretty Woman to Steel Magnolias, where she would get her first Academy Award nominee, first Golden Globe win, blockbuster after blockbuster. One thing I do want to point out about Pretty Woman, so this is how close it came to her almost not hitting that run of movies that I just talked about. Roberts was cast in Pretty Woman after actresses Michelle Pfeiffer, Molly Ringwald, Meg Ryan, Jennifer Jason Lee, Karen Allen, and Daryl Hannah all said no to the role. <laughs> Whoops. Yep. One of them, Molly Ringwald, looking at you, <laughs> ha- have to say yes to that role. There probably isn't Steel Magnolias. And then she doesn't get the Academy Award knob. And then there's no Sleeping with the Enemy or Hook or or just the succession of movies afterwards. As far as some of the personal life, she runs a production company, Red OM Films, with her sister, Lisa Roberts Jillian. She almost married Keith or Sutherland, but broke with broke up with him days before their wedding. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> snuck by that one. <laughs> she married country singer Lyle Lovett in 93 for some ungodly reason. <laughs> I knew with Julia Roberts, like when I saw her, I was like, how the hell did they do this? And I started doing math, like the years, so like, oh, okay. Okay. It was they, before. They got her early. Yeah, they got her early. Yeah. <laughs> Dad comes out and says, Homicide is coming to take Sun- Sunny's stuff. They're the ones that are going to do the investigation. No one wants to go through Sunny's stuff. So Tubbs just comes over and starts angrily shoving stuff into a box and leaves a note about Manolo that was like Manolo's boat in the paperwork. Judy tries to talk to him. But he's like, whatever. He storms out. At the hospital, Sonny is alive. Johnny Five is alive. <laughs> <laughs> Miraculously, he doesn't have any scratches on him, though. No, I mean, he, he blew good, up. Yeah. Like, <laughs> how did that happen? <laughs> no real scratches. Questioning his doctor's competency. I don't think the dermatologist was available this time. <laughs> <laughs> he looks like he's totally awake, and there's doctors on him. So it looks like, but it looks like a dream sequence too. But Gutierrez is walking around. And he lights a cigar, and he's telling the doctor like. He's got information that I want. Um, You better wake his ass up. That way I can get that information out of him. And Sonny Chokes, like he's wide awake. We find out later, like he was like in a coma, but then maybe he was awake. I don't know. He was just, he was groggy. He was in and out of it. Like they had given him medicine. That's what they took in his pills. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. The the lady said, well, we gave him medicine to make him tired. So he's not going (laughs) to. Later at the hospital, Sonny's sitting in a wheelchair. The doctor comes up to him and says that, exactly like, Gutierrez had said, but she wants that information, and I wouldn't mess with Gutierrez. He's a bad man. He also says that I know you don't really remember who you are, but I'm pretty sure you're Sonny Burnett, and you drive a really nice Ferrari and know some bad people. So I'm pretty sure you're a drug dealer. None of my business. But I'm pretty sure you're a drug dealer. That was was that guy really trying to help? Because he was kind of creepy if he was trying to help. I don't know, but he brings up a good question. We have seen Sonny Burnett, Sonny Crockett's alter ego, number of different things. We have seen him be a drug dealer, an arms dealer, a boxing promoter, money man. So I guess my question through most of the episode is who is Sonny Burnett, the criminal? <laughs> yeah. The why of Sonny Burnett. <laughs> yes. Out at Manolo's, two men have picked up Sonny. They've taken him out to his house. It's in Fort Lauderdale. It's not actually in Miami. Polly greets him at the door. They walk in and they see Manolo. They have a meeting. Manolo asks, like, hey, you okay? I want to make sure you rest enough. And Sonny's look, man, I'm fine. I don't need to rest anymore. I'm into other activities. And he stares at Polly. What's up, girl? <laughs> 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 then the men go outside and they go look at his Manolo's cock. chickens. His cock. <laughs> Just say it. Yeah, hey. <laughs> those were roosters. Hey, I know what those not, were. We're not being insulting. <laughs> I, I know you're going to stick her. Manolo is a champion cockfighter. Yep. He's very accomplished in cock management. <laughs> you might say he grooms them. He grooms his cocks very well. <laughs> he spends a lot of time with his prize cock. <laughs> it's all true. 
and not at all inappropriate. <laughs> also, hat tip to Sonny. He goes to become Sonny Burnett. Suddenly, he's got a lot better fashion taste. Yeah, all of a sudden, he looks like a real businessman. <laughs> not some <laughs> designer. <laughs> <laughs> Long story short, Manolo asked him to investigate some missing drug money or something. So now we know. Uh, so we're starting Sonny Burnett. Apparently something is a detective for criminal organizations. That's <laughs> where I'm leaning right now. And this is when we see that Gutierrez is at Manolo's house. But now he's wearing a sling, his arm in a sling, goes up to Sonny and says, Hey, man, wait, before the explosion, you said you were going to tell me something. But you, then you never did. You happen to remember what that was? And he's like, no, man, I almost blew up. <laughs> I don't even know who I am. He's not being he's, he's not being very subtle, like with his his tactics. He's like, hey, I want to know. <laughs> also, if you blow up, do you just break an arm? I mean, I'm confused by all this stuff. Yeah, like you don't blow up and you're not burned well, or anything. <laughs> technically, technically, Gutierrez didn't blow up. He, yeah, he clumsily exactly. jumped off of a boat into another boat. But I guess and what that I'm saying seemed is, to have somehow hurt his arm. <laughs> I guess what I'm saying is, if you're being faking like you've been on an explosion, maybe you should go for something more than a broken arm. <laughs> <laughs> Wrap a bandage around your head. Come on. <laughs> Play it up. <laughs> the key point that I have here is that Sonny is looking very frustrated. He's very confused. He's very frustrated. He, You can tell like he's a fish out of water. He's like, I think this is where I'm supposed to be. But, but, it, does, but it doesn't feel right. Exactly. But it doesn't feel right to him. But they keep telling him that's who he is. So he's like, okay, I guess this is it. So these next scenes, we get Tubbs going to this like messy fake office. And it's basically, it can all be summed up by Tubbs doing investigative stuff. <laughs> it, that ultimately ends with dad catching him working in the dark like they all do. I don't know why they don't just turn lights on. <laughs> um, it, would, My- it would seem to make work easier. <laughs> so, but yeah, and, and him basically trying to lie to dad, like, no, I swear I wasn't working. I was on vacation. <laughs> see, when he sees that name of Doris, and he goes and sees Doris at the pool. That's my favorite scene in this episode, because there's like, first of all, Doris is extra to, to the max. Two, there's like a man in flesh colored swim <laughs> working trunks. out. <laughs> and there's another guy that's like flexing poolside. Oh, like. yeah, that's a different guy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and the scenes are really pointless because all he finds out is that Manola doesn't live in Miami. Yeah, and he's like, oh, thank you. I mean, I think maybe he could have got more information out of her. He's like, she's like, yeah, Fort Lauderdale. He goes, thanks, bye. It's like, maybe she has an address. <laughs> One fast stop off at Manolo's is where Gutierrez then comes up again and muscles Polly out of the way. Who's she's saying like, I really like hoods. Yeah, she's really laying it on. Polly, we get it. Are we sure she's not a hooker? <laughs> she, she may be still playing a hooker in this episode. <laughs> and Gutierrez just comes up and says, hey, you remember that thing yet? And Sonny says, no, but I do remember one thing. I remember seeing you at the hospital and you didn't have your arm in a sling. You lit your cigar with that arm. And then he goes over to Sonny goes over to Manolo and says, Gutierrez is your man that blew up the boat. I know because he didn't have a sling, his arm in a sling, last time I saw him. He's faking it. He's faking it. And then this is when we get to the precinct for Tubbs is turning in his quote unquote vacation time or dad totally knows you're going to do some vigilante tubs. <laughs> Just don't slap too many people, please. <laughs> <laughs> but why is the deal hiding in the shadows? Like he pops out in the hallway. What are you doing? <laughs> what about the other guy that's sitting there? There's another guy sitting <laughs> in the background. No one's talking to him. He's just working away. <laughs> like, who are you? And what kind of work are you doing in the middle of the night? <laughs> I'm telling you, man. They just show up and start working in the dark. Like, like no lights on. <laughs> just sitting at their desk. <laughs> now we jump to a deal where Gino, another one of Manolo's men, is doing a drug deal with s- some other people. And while they're in the middle of the drug deal, a man gets out of the trunk for the other dealers and tries to go sneak around behind Gino so they could just rob Gino but then Sonny comes walking out of nowhere shoots the man the man goes down then he walks up closer and does the finishing off shot in the back of the head as he walks by brutal <laughs> I know right oh, brutal <laughs> yeah this is way more brutal okay. than I imagined it was gonna be <laughs> okay so Sonny Burnett not not detective for criminals Sonny Burnett murderous gangster got it <laughs> Turns out, like, he's really and I'm pretty ruthless. sure, yeah, like, he locked all the guys in the trunk, and I'm pretty sure, like, they were hinting that he was going to kill them, too. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah, mm. I think that's exactly what that was supposed to mean. Like, go ahead and sit in there, because I'm going to kill you, so. 
<laughs> it was brutal. I'm not ready for this, Sonny. He was like, okay, Sonny does kill a lot of people. He's, he's yeah, but a accidentally a lot of times. Or okay? you, know, you <laughs> can justify it. This was like gangland style. Yeah. You know what he needs? He needs a thing. He should. To- he should have totally shot one of those guys with two different guns. You know, <laughs> like Frank. <laughs> At Manolo, Sonny's there cleaning his gun, and Polly comes over and says that he's expected in an hour to go see Manolo. And Sonny asks Polly, "Hey, so why are you so efficient?" And she's like, "I no, don't always. Sometimes I go crazy for you." And he leans in for a kiss, and then teases her, and then walks away. And then Goody, but Gutierrez is watching the entire time, and he is very jealous in of what's happening. His see-through shirt. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> not <laughs> that I got shirt a different... was too much. <laughs> I took something else away from that scene that Sonny Burnett is banging Julia Roberts and I want a Sonny Burnett show now. <laughs> um. So now Gutierrez is going to go talk to Manolo. Gutierrez's deals aren't really working out that well. He's only moving small quantities and helping out with Ma- Manolo. Meanwhile, Sonny Burnett <laughs> is murdering bringing people. In windfall profits. <laughs> <laughs> so Manolo <laughs> wants Gutierrez to take Sonny with him on his next deal. Down at the Fort Lauderdale precinct, Tubbs comes walking in wearing his badge. He's on vacation. Just saying he's on vacation. He's on a police officer right now. And he knows an- another officer there, Rolando. They come running over, high-fiving, back-slapping. They've known each other for a long time. And Tubbs like, hey, can we go in the office? Let's go talk about something private. He walks in. This other man named Jimmy walks in, makes a couple snide comments about an out-of-town police officer being there, hands Rolando a file, then leaves. And then Tubbs gets straight down to business. He wants him all the information he can get on Manolo. Rolando says, no can do, man. IAD is all over this case because they think there's a mole inside of the precinct that's feeding information to Manolo because he's always one step ahead of us. So I can't get you a- any information. And Tub says, oh, I thought we were cool. I mean, I thought we were good. You know, I, th- I thought I was, I was here and you were going to help me out, but I guess not. I understand. It's, it's fine. He slowly backs out of the room. And he said, yeah, he's like, I, I guess some things really do change now that you got that badge. <laughs> <laughs> Harsh, <laughs> promotion. Man. Like I thought you were friends. Yeah, but I don't. I would like to know where they know each other from because I mean, he he acts like he doesn't have you know. any friends in Miami. <laughs> it's just Sunny. So now we're gonna go back to Gangland Sunny. They're out doing a deal. Him and Gu- Gutierrez are sitting in the car. This is what this deal was that Manolo sent Gutierrez out on. It's late. Gutierrez calls Manolo and says, "Hey, your dealer." never showed up so we're gonna leave and manolo says okay fine let me talk to sunny there's a few quiet seconds to sunny he doesn't say anything he just hangs up the phone and gutierrez says all right man i know what's up here can you at least hear me out like hear out what my thoughts are and hear like what my plan was is yet you have to know that manolo was getting too powerful and then he slowly reaches in for a gun in the door of the car and sunny says hey but i know exactly what the sound of a 38 caliber handgun sounds like and then he pulls out his gun and shoots Gutierrez right in the freaking face. Right in the head. <laughs> like, oh, his yeah. gun's powerful enough to shoot out the glass out the driver's side window, too. And, you know, like, this scene to me had very much like a, a Godfather feel. Because it's like he figures out that Sonny's, they Sonny brought him out there, kill him. At first, he starts giving them the speech. Hey, you know, please, for old time's sake. You know, and he, but he starts reaching for that gun. But this Sonny Brunette guy... The Sunny Brunette, you know, murderous assassin. Dude, he's a pretty, he's a badass dude, man. I could watch Sunny Brunette running around killing people for the uh, <laughs> Manolo gang. At the Fairmont Hotel, Tubbs is waiting for a call. He's reading the paper, waiting to get more information. Rolando calls and says, they found Gutierrez's body and washed up on shore. He didn't die from an explosion. He died from a gunshot to the freaking face. And it only happened like 10 hours ago. So people survived from that boat. Which is what Tubbs has thought all along. He said, when he talked to Castillo, he was like, there's no body. And Castillo's like, we have to find that body. That's what we have to do. And Tubbs is like, well, that's where I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> Tubbs had such an impact that the guy's calling him like, hey, man, here's a tip. Please like me. <laughs> <laughs> Tubbs asks again, okay, how do I get a hold of Manolo? And he's like, you'll be my badge. But by the way, he owns this art gallery called the feature gallery so that's where tubbs is off to the next day he goes into the club which looks an awful lot like bruce willis's house in season one (laughs) we won't talk about that though (laughs) (laughs) tubbs is looking at the art gallery dominic (laughs) 
Tubbs is looking at the paintings inside. He hands Polly his card as Cooper and says he wants to talk to Mr. Manolo about, you know, less amateur stuff. Manolo's watching through a security camera, too, so he's immediately intrigued by Cooper, too. Also kind of paranoid. <laughs> <laughs> at the Lauderdale precinct, Tubbs goes in to talk to Rolando. He's like, look, I got a setup. He, I'm, I'm in with Manolo. I'm gonna, he's going to call me. We're definitely going to set up a deal. I need money to be able to make this deal. Rolando says, we don't got that kind of money around here. We're not Miami. This is Fort Lauderdale. We don't have the unlimited budget that you and Sonny have. I can't just give you cash. And Tubbs just keeps at it. And Rolando finally agrees. Okay, fine. I'll get this because he because this is a cop murderer. But you have to wear a bulletproof vest. No questions asked. You have to wear one. And Tubbs reluctantly agrees. It's like, all right, fine. Fine. If that's what it's going to take, then that's what I'm going to do. Yeah, which... Man, coming in like, hey, please pay for my investigation. I only need ten thousand dollars. You huh. know, I'm also on vacation, um, and not here as and, a police good, officer. Yeah, good on his friend. You know, saying, "Man, like, no vest, no money, you cocky bastard." <laughs> you know, you're already going without backup. <laughs> At Manolo's, Jimmy, the police officer that we've only seen briefly, and it was a red flag immediately that he was interested in what the conversation was, is the dirty cop. He's telling Manolo that. Cooper is actually Tubbs, and he's out to get revenge from a uh, cop, his partner, that was murdered on that boat that exploded. His name is Sonny Crockett. And I know you happen to have this he guy named Sonny Burnett that's getting really close to you. He actually hasn't put, I don't think he's actually put all of the pieces together because he's like, oh yeah, Tubbs, you know, he's on this mission to get this guy, to, to get the guy that killed his partner. Some guy named Sonny that blew up on a boat. You know any boats <laughs> blow up recently? Anyone yeah, he Sonny? doesn't know. He's right. He's like he puts. He doesn't put it together to right then. He's like Sunny. Sunny what? <laughs> <laughs> oh well, that's not my guy. My guy's Burnett. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> Crockett. No, Crockett sounds nothing like Burnett. They can't be the same person. <laughs> so now Manolo has a serious problem because he's let Sunny get really close to him and be on the inside circle, and he goes out to the balcony and looks down, and Sunny's sitting poolside <laughs> in his suit. He just looks over his shoulder like, hey, girl, what's up? <laughs> and he goes back to his paper. Yeah, why is he like sitting out there with a full suit on? <laughs> I'm making a joke like he's like that, but he actually looks really creepy. Yeah, he's right? I know. There, like in Damien, when the mom's yes. looking at him and the kid's just down there lo looking up at her yeah. like, there's Damien. I mean, Sonny sitting poolside. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny you say that because like the conversation ends with the dirty cop going, I think he's crazy. And Manello's, he's crazy, huh? Let's test him. And then he looks down and suddenly gives him that creepy look. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah I think he's crazy. <laughs> I was, at least for me, I was pretty sure what was going to happen next. I don't know about you guys. I thought it was going to take more time, but this happens really fast because Manolo calls Tubbs. They set up a deal. It's going to happen in an alley. So this and is where Manolo's we go. Manolo's favorite as new assassin is going to go to be the one to show up to kill Tubbs. We go to the alley. It's set up perfectly for Vice. Yes, it's it is. dark, yeah. steamy, smoky <laughs> with thunder and lightning. Tubbs is walking down and out of the Peter smoke. Peter real video <laughs> out of the smoke comes walking sunny and i thought it was gonna be slower like there's gonna be a moment where they were gonna like talk and Sonny was gonna pause sunny doesn't even freaking pause he just walks up and caps tubs like three times yep but decides not to do the finishing shot he just sees that he's dead and then walks on like doesn't even bat an eye doesn't stop walking he just massacres Tubbs and then walks on like nothing happened. And Tubbs doesn't really have a chance to like say anything either because it's that fast. Mm -hmm. Like he sees him in the shadow and it's mm -hmm. like you could tell like if, if he had like another minute he would recognize him and be go Sunny. Yeah. <laughs> nope. Now yes. I will say that this is my first time going through the show. I haven't seen all the episodes. Tubbs is one of my he's one of my he's probably my favorite character on the show. And I say all the time he's my second favorite cop too behind trudy but with the with it being tubs and this show turning into the sunny crockett show i'm seriously concerned like oh my god tubs is dead <laughs> <laughs> what is that like crockett's fifth dead partner <laughs> i said earlier, only a matter of time before he started shooting him himself yeah i said earlier that I think that this this episode proves that maybe Tubbs is a better friend than Crockett ever was. <laughs> <laughs> because like if something happened to Tubbs, Crockett would be like, yeah, he'd mourn for a while, but he wouldn't go do any heavy investigating. <laughs> he didn't do it with any other partners that died. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like Dominic said, like it happened so fast. Like I was with Dom where I thought there was going to be a moment where he hesitates, where why do I know this guy? Just flat out just caps him and like moves on. we we'll parked or something, you know? <laughs> <laughs> when we come back from commercial, we're on the beach. Sunny in an all white suit comes walking up to dad in an all black suit. He's not wearing any shoes, by the way. Sin. He's just standing there barefoot. But Sonny's wearing shoes. <laughs> well, Sonny's uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> Sonny looks at him briefly, walks on up to 10 feet, stops, turns around, walks by, sees Stan, sees other people all dressed in black back there at a funeral. He sees a casket leaning up against the caddy. He looks in there. It's Tubbs in the casket. Then Tubbs suddenly wakes up, starts screaming for Sonny. Sonny is confused, walks backwards, sees a grave, an empty grave, looks over it sees himself in a casket, slips, falls into the empty grave, wakes up, he's in bed with Polly. It's all just a bad dream. Or was it? No, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> For the part where he probably boned Polly, but... <laughs> Sonny leaves and goes into the bathroom, trying to collect his thoughts. This is, again, more that he's confused, he's conflicted, he recognizes some people, some people he doesn't, he doesn't know what's happening. Something is off. At the hospital, Tubbs... He's still alive. He's there talking to a doctor and Rolando. Tubbs was wearing that vest. That's what saved his life. And actually, he doesn't even have to stay in the hospital. He's just seeing a doctor. And the doctor's like, don't call me in the morning because I'll be golfing. <laughs> what kind of crap doctor are you? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> don't you know? I'm a, uh, I'm a famous dermatologist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he needed the dermatologist at this point. He would have got better bedside manner. <laughs> <laughs> but not a man in a hurry. <laughs> yeah, I gotta go golfing. I got a good time for you. Rolando asks Tubbs if he's gonna tell Castillo, and he's like, nah, man. My ex partner who's supposed to be dead that's out murdering people now. Like the last thing I want is more police on this. Let me try and work some stuff uh, out here. No, I think maybe you need more police on this. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it doesn't last long. Reluctantly, he ends up having to ask Dad for help anyway. And Dad is more than happy to oblige. They go to the Fort Lauderdale precinct. Rolando's talking to Tubbs. They're all real suspicious of everyone in there because that means that word got to Manolo that Cooper was a cop, and Jimmy is watching the entire conversation. Tubbs goes to make a phone call to Castillo to see if he can find out what the IAD investigation is finding, because IAD won't tell Rolando. Because Castillo is a better lieutenant. That's what that is. <laughs> He's got more pull. Because, you know... It and because clearly IAD likes Vice better, you know, because of all their interactions together. <laughs> well, I mean, to be fair, like this can't be the same IAD, okay? Because they're two different departments. It's not the same one. <laughs> they're like Fort Lauderdale and Miami are not close to each other. So <laughs> maybe I don't know why that makes, which makes no sense why they'd give that information to Castillo, I don't but know whatever. Why either. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> While Tubbs on the phone, he finds out that Jimmy is the one that's being investigated. Meanwhile, Jimmy's on the phone with Matt Manolo saying, hey, Crockett didn't, or Burnett, didn't kill that cop. The cop's still alive. I see him right here. Which is a mistake. He tried. <laughs> <laughs> Give him credit. He tried to do his job. <laughs> yeah. Which I also want to point out, dumb little Jimmy over here calling Manolo from his desk phone. Hey, what you doing? Calling you from the <laughs> office. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, they can't be traced, right? Like, can they just look at the phone records? <laughs> IAD is not listening to the phone calls that are happening inside the station. Because <laughs> eh, IAD sucks. So, <laughs> 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 so now Manolo says, well, you're going to have to prove your weight because now that I'm being investigated, that means you're probably involved with that, too, because IA has fingered you part of this, which means that they're going to finger me. And so you need to take care of this. Out at Manolo's, Sonny comes in to talk to Manolo. He tells him, hey, I got a $100,000 deal. I want you to go broker. I want you to go with Jimmy. Sonny's like, nah, I don't like that. I want someone else. He's like, and Manolo says, no, you have to go with him. He's like, fine. Then I'm going to go on the boat. Yeah, I'm taking the boat. <laughs> <laughs> Dad, is that okay with you? I take the boat. <laughs> so now we're going to go to the final scene of the episode. When Tubbs finds out that it's Jimmy is dirty one, they look and see that Jimmy is gone. So they race off to go to the feature gallery. At the gallery, Sonny is getting on a boat with Jimmy. Sonny says, I don't like going out with Manolo's men. They're all trigger happy. And Jimmy says, well, I don't like it either. But let's make a deal. How about I kill you? And then you don't have to worry about this anymore. Well, he also says his name. He said, how about I? Kill you? How about we get this done with Crockett? Yeah, and yeah because Jimmy says, sorry, Sonny says, I don't like to deal with dirty cops. And yeah. Jimmy says, neither do I. Yeah, and then he says, yeah, Crockett. 
<laughs> and then Crockett's like, you mean Burnett? And he spells his name out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, B-U-R-N-E double T and then pulls out a gigantic freaking handgun and shoots and kills Jimmy and then drives the boat away. Because Jimmy had his gun on him. Let's get yeah. that straight. Well, <laughs> it was, because Jimmy's it was a, a terrible assassin. <laughs> Because clearly, Net or Crockett is way better at this than he ever was at being a cop. Because Jimmy decided to spend five minutes trying to get Crockett to understand a joke that was just going right over his head. (laughs) (laughs) Rolando and Tubbs show up late. They show up just in time for Tubbs to see Sonny shoot and kill Jimmy and then drive the boat away. And Tubbs just yells, Sonny! He can't hear you on that boat. Stella! <laughs> on! <laughs> and that's the end of the episode. So let me say this. Let me say this really fast. This has nothing to do with the actual storyline of the, of the episode. This just has to do with Miami Vice. What the fuck, man? What the <laughs> fuck? If this is 1988 and you end the season like this, I got to wait all my ass all the way until September for the next. This episode didn't say nothing. All I said was that Sonny was off his rocker. I don't know what the hell's happening here. You got to make me wait three months. And what if I didn't catch this episode at the end of the season? When was I going to be able to see it again? I may start season five and not know what happened at the end of season four. What now, the hell, man? Now you know what yeah. I went Why through. Why is Sonny killing people? <laughs> <laughs> Wait all summer for that. <laughs> you got to take care of that VHS when you, when you recorded that yeah, episode exactly. off TV. <laughs> then if you mess it up and <laughs> start recording until halfway through the episode, God damn it. <laughs> She's evil. She's evil to end the season on this episode. All the previous seasons we ended with, there wasn't a big cliffhanger. It was like a really deep story. It was that, a big story. Just, ended with. Yeah, mm-hmm. but this is the first time they've ever done the big cliffhanger. And it was a cliffhanger. I also wonder, did they plan this from the beginning? Was the amnesia story from the beginning? Or did they throw this out there because of the struggling ratings that they decided to try and do the amnesia story at the end of the season? I bet you it was because of the ratings. I, because amnesia was all the rage, right? Dallas was doing amnesia. Maybe I, they were I doing the, same, the Bobby storyline. I am, I am going to throw back out a joke I made earlier about our favorite bomb technician actor pitching a script multiple times <laughs> might not have had anything we're like all right f it what do you got <laughs> coma i'm listening amnesia i mean you're right melissa amnesia was like a popular storyline and if you grew up in the 80s things like amnesia and quicksand were gonna be much bigger problems in your life than they ended up being i was so afraid of being hit on the head <laughs> <laughs> All those episodes are like like Full House when Stephanie got hit in the head with the, like something and then she couldn't remember who she was. I can name them all because I watched all the sitcom stuff. It happened on it happened on Growing Pains too, and it also happened on Fam- not Family Matters. Uh, what's the other one with uh, Michael J. Fox? Family Ties. Family Ties. It happened on there. Jennifer got Family hit in the head. Ties, she didn't remember yeah. who she was. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's funny, Melissa. That reminds me of something I saw on Twitter. Someone was talking about how when they were a kid, they were in the, really in the dinosaurs. And so the first time they saw a shooting star, they just laid down on the ground and prepared uh, <laughs> uh, for the meteor to strike the earth. I was going around with a helmet on so I didn't get hit in the head because I didn't want to forget who I was. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's this episode. I have many more thoughts when it comes to the well, I'm sure you do. <laughs> continued portion from last week to this week. Some continuity problems here that I got. And I got a lot of problems with you people <laughs> on how you <laughs> ended this season. And then the to be continued, I got to work some things out. Luckily, I'll be able to parse that information and be able to simmer down during the music segment. So let's go break down this, this week's music. All right, John. This is a music segment of fantastic band names. What do you got for us this week? All right. So let's start with the one I've already mentioned before. We have the song Money God by Big Pig. Big Pig, you might remember from our episode of Spalls of Death. They were the Australian rock group, funk rock group from 1985, 1991. To refresh your memory, they are the band. They had like eight or nine drummers, and they were inspired by those Japanese taiko drummers. Their signature look was wearing those black waterproof aprons. <laughs> you, you remember me talking about them? Yeah. yeah, that's Big Pig. Long story short, uh, they had a short run. They had a crap load of drummers, like eight people sang at one time. It was just chaos. 
chaos people. <laughs> <laughs> but for some reason, people in Australia, uh, mostly in Australia and New Zealand, liked it. If there was ever a place in the world for chaos to reign supreme, it's New Zealand and Australia. So now that we've reminisced about Big Big, let's talk about some other funny band names. <laughs> Let's go with Bedbugs and Ballyhoo, the song by Echo and the Bunnymen. They're an English rock band formed in 1978. The original lineup was Ian McCulloch on vocals, William Sargent on guitar, and Les Pattinson on bass, along with the most important band member, Drum Machine. <laughs> Yes, they didn't actually have a drummer. They had a drum machine when they first rolled out. But eventually, by 1980, they would bring in D. Fritas as the drummer to replace the important, irreplaceable member <laughs> drum machine. <laughs> Basically, Ian McCulloch, he, he had been in a few smaller bands. I often like to talk their previous band names because I find a lot of these people's previous bands have fantastic names he started out in like a garage band called crucial three he then did a band called a shallow madness now shallow madness clearly wasn't succeeding because of their name so they changed it to the teardrop explodes <laughs> things were weren't working out and so they fired Ian McCulloch. Ian McCulloch joined with Sargent and Pat uh, Pattinson to come up with Echo the Bunnyman. And just to make things completely ironic, they would debut opening for, you guessed it, The Teardrop Explodes. <laughs> <laughs> the band he was previously fired from at a, at a club in Liverpool. Hey, guess what, Teardrop Explodes? You may have fired them, but Echo and the Bunnymen, way more successful than anyone from the Teardrop Explodes. In fact, I don't even know if they ever made it out of Liverpool. <laughs> so Echo and the Bunnymen, they debuted with their album Crocodiles, which hit, uh, which landed in the top 20 UK charts. They would see mainstream success with their album Porcupine, which would climb to number two in the UK, and then their success would peak in 1984 with Ocean Rain, which reached number four, pretty much the high point in their career. Because in 85, they would release a single and a compilation album called Songs to Learn and Sing. After that, drummer De Fruitas would leave the band. They would record another album with a less successful album with a temporary drummer, and then McCulloch himself would quit in 88. And to make things worse for the Bunnymen, Fritas would die in a motorcycle accident in 1989. The remaining members would scramble. They would try to reforge some semblance of a band, but fans and critics weren't fooled. So they would end up disbanding by 1993. After that, McCulloch and Sargent, uh, Sargent would work together in 94 under the new name Electro Fix. But ultimately, they would rebuild the Bunnymen in 97 continue touring and releasing all throughout the 2000s. So then we jump to Alpha Centauri by Tangerine Dream. Tangerine Dream, another fantastic name. <laughs> they are the German electronic music band formed in 1967 by Edgar Frosch. Frosch pretty much being the main, the only common member of the band. They would see very, very main lineup changes over the years, but Frosch would... would the only continuous member until his death in 2015. Now, most bands, when like the lead singer dies and they have to hold auditions to replace them, Roche actually named a successor. <laughs> so when he passed away in 2015, Thorsten Quashening. <laughs> now, uh, now heads the band. He was promoted, obviously. Frost after being his successor, and he's been the most member of the band because he joined as far back as 2005. A little bit about uh, Tangerine Dream, or aka Edgar Froish. He was really a pioneer in like electronic music. Aside from releasing over a hundred albums, 
He composed film soundtracks for over 20 movies. Damn. Some of those movies, Sorcerer, Thief, Risky Business, Firestarter, etc., etc. Even helped create the soundtrack for Grand Theft Auto V. Really? <laughs> Froish uh, arrived in West Berlin in the 1960s to study art. His first band, The Ones, disbanded after only one single. <laughs> A little foreshadowing. I, I know. Like, like you only lasted one song. Does that even count? <laughs> and they're appropriately named the ones, though. So, like, it's almost like they knew. So, after that debacle, he would play smaller gigs at the world-famous Zodiac Free Arts Lab, including, which is very cool, playing for surrealist painter Salvador Dali while he painted. Damn. This guy's got some serious connections. What makes him super cool, too, and, like, what made him one of the pioneers of electronic or electro- electronic music was that Froch, he was fascinated by technology, and he often built custom-made instruments, as well as collecting sounds, uh, random sounds with a tape recorder to use in his music. So, like, he was the first on, like, mixing all that stuff in, and, and he was really doing it by building everything himself. Like, he didn't have like, mixers and, and all of the equipment equalizers and stuff that people have today so when those things started to come out like his stuff got even better pretty much the their fame ran through the 70s which is often known as their virgin records era uh, and they toured extensively in the 70s and 80s so but ultimately Froish would die in 2014 of a pulmonary embolism and like i mentioned earlier he'd already named his successor so uh, we ahead. wish <laughs> Planning ahead, and we wish Thorsten, you know, all of the best, even though Forge's kid doesn't think he can hack it, but, you know. <laughs> I feel like I'm underprepared for this podcast, and I need to set a successor. There needs to be a successor to the professor. <laughs> <laughs> you just had yes. to say that. Huh? Yes. <laughs> Random side note from pop culture. In the 1983 movie Valley Girl, Nicolas Cage... Cage's character, Randy, can be seen wearing a Tangerine Dream concert t-shirt during the I Melt With You montage. Mm. So That's the best montage ever. <laughs> no. Yes. No. no. I know it's not a Rocky montage. The best montage ever is in Rocky. So, <laughs> no. This can be number two. We, we disagree about which montage is the best, though, so we can't get into that. Yeah, yeah, because Rocky Four montage <laughs> with a robot and... Apollo Creed dying is the greatest montage ever. Oh, yeah. Okay. We do agree then. We agree. I thought you were going to talk about the one where they, the montage where they run on the beach. Because that's in that. So it's see, it's like it breaches both. Okay. okay. But the part where they run into the water, then they hug each other. That's from Rocky Short III. shorts and halter yeah. tops on. Yeah, that would be. But it's it's in the Rocky Four montage too. Like he, he pictures yeah. that whole running scene. Plus so there's a robot. It's got everything. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Okay. We agree. All right, so that's you guys' music. And actually, a little bit, uh, quite, you know, more famous than it would appear by their goofy names. Just remember, this music segment had Salvador Dali with bands such as Big Pig, Echo and the Bunnymen, <laughs> and Tangerine Dream. <laughs> Who would know, huh? <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh, and I threw a Valley Girl, Nick Cage mm-hmm. reference in there, along with a Billy Idol song montage moment. So <laughs> we're going places, folks. All right. Well, let's go give our final thoughts on this, the last episode of season four. All right. I'm going to start. And oh. You know, when I start, Uh-oh. I got a strong opinion. <laughs> Shots fired. <laughs> That's when Dominic There's starts. There's a rant coming. <laughs> <laughs> this is a great episode. This is, and it's a, the perfect setup episode for the Sunny Amnesia storyline because you have to get the feel for he's out of control. He doesn't know who he is, but he's conflicted, but he thinks he's gangster. And so that's what he's going to do. It's kind of slow at times, but that's the whole point of this episode is to make sure it sets up all the fantastic stuff that's going to happen in season five with the, with the Amnesia story arc. So I'm okay with there not being a lot of the Vice team being involved in this, so we don't get a real chance with Dad is white tech and the ladies that it's just a Tubbs and Sunny episode. That's totally fine with me. I do appreciate that he's super conflicted throughout the entire thing. Like things don't feel a hundred percent correct. But man, is this a violent turn for Sunny? And he's really, really dangerous in this. And I am like still in shock. And like what he did in that, like 
like that guy that he killed where he does like the finishing shot in the back of the head to make sure that he's dead. Like, this is brutal. I was not prepared for brutal Sonny Burnett. That was not going to be a thing. Sonny Burnett was never this way when he was his undercover persona. Now, that might have been what was rumored about him. But remember, most of the time, he was a connections man. He knew someone who knew someone else. He could pair them together. He was never this way. Where did this come from? Did this awaken something inside of Sonny that no one knew that he was really a serial killer the entire time? <laughs> <laughs> we get how- hint of that for the Meat Fondler episode. <laughs> My last point that I'll make here. Remember last week was a to be continued storyline. <laughs> you fuckers. Am I right? was no this was be. not a to be continued episode. That was a total fake out to get me to come back and watch the next episode. Yes, I understand the storyline is like more Sunny becoming unhinged, but he gets blown up. That's how he <laughs> ends up here with amnesia. The to be continued was a farce. <laughs> and I say that not knowing what happens in season five. So I might be proven wrong by what happens in season five in the first few episodes of season five. Guy like, oh, I get where they're going. Like the, the storyline is going to go this way. Having not seen those, I have no idea. So right now, my advice, you left me on a gigantic cliffhanger at the end of the season. I have to wait all summer to find out what happens. <laughs> and this wasn't even a continuation of the repercussion of him murdering someone on an island. We don't even know what's going to happen. I'm sure it's going to come up later. But I'm very <laughs> upset with how many cliffhangers I got going on right now. <laughs> John, <Just> to remember. <laughs> what are your final thoughts? I am a vice coming in strong at the end of the season. Um, I almost feel like they should have broken this up more because I think it was like it was too much to handle in the last three episodes. Crockett's been shot. His wife was murdered. Someone on a beach somewhere. And now he's <laughs> like some badass yardy dude. <laughs> <laughs> Like they should have broke it up. Like he should have got shot at the beginning of the season. They should have killed his wife somewhere in the middle. And then he becomes like the badass gangster at the end. I'm with you a little bit. This isn't the Burnett we're used to. I have mentioned before, I am a fan of badass Burnett. We have seen a little bit. You remember, you know, when he beat the guy up and threw him off the boat. <laughs> so we've seen a little bit of tough guy Burnett, but not like this. I mean, he's just cold blooded, no remorse killer. But I'm digging it. Watch Burnett. If this is what season five is going to be like, I'm excited. Maybe this is what he should have been doing all along. He seems to be a natural at it. <laughs> Essentially eliminated all of Manolo's competition or, or leaks. His right hand man. He's living the good life. He's, things are going <laughs> well. He might not even want to come back. If he would just kill that pesky Tubbs, he'd be going free. <laughs> I am really digging this, and I'm hoping that we get plenty more of the badass Burnett through season five. I do hope that doesn't mean that we see less of the ladies, because I do want them to get involved in this. I am totally down for it. Who cares if he murdered someone on, on an island? That goes up with chop that up with the pirates that are hunting him, the missing Tubbs baby, and all of the other <laughs> mysteries <laughs> that we'll never find answers to. Melissa, what are your final thoughts? I have been talking about for weeks. I was waiting for this. <laughs> <laughs> so I was exa- I mean, I already I've already seen it. I know what happens, but I'm still like ready to I'm ready to watch the continuation right now. <laughs> <laughs> And it's only, I'm just going to say, it's only the, it's like, we're just on the icing on the cake right now. We have not heard, we have not seen the real ruthless Sonny. Mm. Well, going to huh? start cutting people's ears off? <laughs> uh, nope, he's wait, he's really ruthless. Is it not his ear? He's very, sorry, not, not maybe as ruthlessly, but he's very Different body lady. part. Once, yeah, once, it, once he goes full Lower. gangster, he's going full gangster. Because we, we saw the one about the bull <laughs> testicles. <laughs> yes. Yeah, no, I mean, I love this episode. It is kind of, I, I agree that it's kind of slow in some parts. And I i don't really care that I don't get to see what happened to Hackman because that's never going to be brought up again. Damn it. <laughs> no, I don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember that. It might further on, but eh, there's no consequences for that. <laughs> but I am kind of sad because, I mean, I, I like season four, but season five is hard because it's the last season. And it goes, and I know everyone always says like, Season five is really dark. It goes really dark <laughs> and some bad stuff happens for people and I'm not ready for that, but <laughs> I'm very excited to, to watch it. And I am excited. You know, I don't, I, I love the whole, my favorite part about the immediate oh, storyline is that Tubbs is like 
he still believes that you can get to you can get to Sonny somehow. If you can talk to him, he can change him. He can be like, I, I I know there's something wrong with him. There's no way my friend would do this. But turns out his friend is a murderer <laughs> who also tries to kill him. <laughs> well, it's like a kid Stark. I mean, God, man. I mean, cutting off testicles and stuff. <laughs> Just going to say more people die. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it of Go With The Heat. We would love to hear from you. Email us, go with the heat at gmail.com. Let us know what your thoughts are on this episode. We are in unanimous decision here that this is a fantastic episode of Vice. My frustration to end it here and have a summer break is where it is. This is such a good episode. I'm very mad that it doesn't start right away. But... In general, we all love this episode. We love where the storyline is going. We are not ready, clearly, to handle season five because things are going to get silly. <laughs> <laughs> and this also means we're saying goodbye to season four. And we're going to talk about this in our recap. But just you know, just remember, season four was the most popular season. And we were really l- looking forward to this because we thought the season was going to get silly. And boy, howdy, did it get silly. <laughs> boy, howdy. <laughs> <laughs> But we'll talk more about that next week when we look back at season four, what our thoughts are and how this season went. We're going to look ahead to season five. And like we said, we'd love to hear from you. Let us know what your thoughts are on this episode. Let us know what you think is the top three episodes of Go With The Heat from season four. Email those to goewiththeheat at gmail.com. Let us know what those are. And then we'll put together our summer reruns that we'll have for three episodes before we pick up on season five. You can also go to goewiththeheat.com. You can go to contact us you can find all the ways to contact us including our twitter and our facebook and our instagram you can find us on all three of those platforms be able to talk to us we have special stuff on all three of those places just for miami vice fans you can also click on support us support number one email us go with the heat at gmail.com let us know on those questions support step number two go rate us on your podcatcher platform of choice particularly itunes if you have an iphone or that's where you get your podcast just go there give it five stars no one will know that I've asked you and told you to go ahead and give us five stars. That'll help people find the show. It'll help with discoverability. If everyone does it right now, if everyone listening to the show goes and does it this weekend, that'd be fantastic for the show. But don't write a review. No one ever reads the reviews. Instead, go in there and say, if you were Tubbs, how you would get Sonny to remember you. We want to hear what your fan fiction could be and how you jog Sonny's memory. On, on More sweaty foot way. play. <laughs> <laughs> Remember this, Sonny? <laughs> <laughs> Support step number three. Check out that Patreon. Patreon.com slash go with the heat. We're going into the last season of Ice. What are we going to do next? We want to hear from you. I want to see your support. So go check out that Patreon. Patreon.com slash go with the heat. And drop a dollar into our tip jar and let us know where you think we should go next after Miami Vice. Because it's getting real close now. And we're going to be at the end of this show. That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode. And we'll see you all next time. Bye, pal. Bye.